So up next, we've got a very, very uh, smart, very, very sophisticated person who's done pretty much everything under the sun, uh, whether it's investing, whether it's building companies, whether it's building products, whether it's crypto, whether it's e-commerce, whether it's ads. Uh, Vinny Lingham seems to know it all. He's a shark on Shark Tank South Africa. He's a uh, an entrepreneur with tons and tons of great companies that he's built. And he's a, an expert in, uh, in, in, in building businesses. So I'm going to bring Vinny Lingham up uh, onto stage now. Hey, Vinny, how are you? Hey, Arthur, good seeing you, man. Good to see you too. So yeah. before we dive in, we'd love to, to hear a quick intro about yourself and, uh, you know, kind of hear what you're up to these days. Sure. Uh, thanks. I'm, uh, you know, th thanks for the quick background. <laughs> I've been an serial entrepreneur for uh, 20 odd years. Built a bunch of companies, uh, been in the crypto investment space, uh, venture capital, angel investing, startups. So, uh, you know, had some good exits. Um, yeah, early investor in Solana, for example, in crypto and uh, got into Bitcoin really early. So I'm one of those guys that gets in really early where I see a trend and then I kind of double down through that. Um, right now I'm working on, um, maybe it's more later stage, but um, trying to find better ways to do video meetings. Um, versus the traditional sort of, you know, uh, methods. And so uh, the company's called Waitroom, and we're trying to, we're testing out new meeting formats. And uh, the first format is rapid fire meeting. So you have a queue of people uh, and each have two or three minutes. Uh, and it's kind of, you know, it's kind of fun to watch. Um, and we're, we're trying that out for different use cases and we have different other, different meeting formats we're looking at as well. So very early stage, but it's a very experimental, but that's my current day job. Fantastic. Well, uh, that, that's great. And we, we use um, weight room for some of our meetings as well and been using it for almost a year now. Um, Thanks for the support. <laughs> absolutely. So you're, uh, you're an investor in Nostra. You, you've been a, a prolific angel investor, um, sometimes doing it on TV uh, even. Kind of what, do you, what do you look for in your angel investments? I know you make quick decisions. You're able to move fast. Kind of how, how do you, what, what are the kind of the key indicators that you're looking for right away? Yeah, so I think there's a couple of things. One is, um, you know, you got to pick a segment that you, you're comfortable in and that you like. So, uh, and that changes over time. Like I'm really into crypto at the moment or have been for, you know, for a while. So non-crypto investments don't get my attention as easily um, just because the nature of, you know, where, where my interest lies. Um, I think the next phase of where I'm going is probably going to be stuff like, um, well, you know, I, I want to jump the gun, but like, I think I like to understand an industry first before I invest in it. And so my, my thesis on, on, on crypto is even within crypto, it's such a big space. I'm focusing on decentralized compute, uh, decentralized, uh, storage. So things like Filecoin and render and even Solana, you know, decentralized smart contracts and, and compute, um, those are things that I, I think are very, very interesting and in where the world's going to move towards. Um, so I, I kind of like dabble in those areas and then I, I write checks pretty quickly to people who are doing stuff in that area. Um, when it's slightly outside of it, I, you know, if I find good people like yourself and I'll write a check and that's great, but that's not, that's not really my core interests, uh, you know, generally. Like I, I've kind of moved on from e-commerce. I was in e-commerce really early. Um, and then, you know, by the time I got to 2014, I kind of moved on to crypto. And not too sure what's next, but um, you know, crypto is still, I still, still think there's a lot of upside and potential in crypto right now. Absolutely. And so you, you've you seen kind of e-commerce grow and now you're seeing crypto grow. Kind of, Are you seeing kind of an intersection at all between e-commerce and, and crypto and kind of a way for them to play off of each other? Not in the short term. I think there's, I mean, NFTs are interesting. It's becoming a uh, you know, bit of a trend and companies are issuing them. We're still not sure what the pricing looks like and uh, how, how that plays out. Um, I think just the use case and utility around NFTs for memberships, for activating applications and software and licenses and that sort of thing is very interesting. Crypto is one very big experiment right now. And so when you look at the global markets, the macro situation where tech is... Um, Crypto is kind of really on the periphery and it's susceptible to, you know, macro moves. I think, um, I think of, I think of crypto as being, um, a, a sandbox for what the world looks like, you know, five years. Uh, the, the, you know, the, like when you're looking at, when you're looking at tech stocks, you're looking 12 months to 24 months ahead. 
when you're investing. When you're looking at crypto, you have to look five years ahead. Um, and so the more you go, to, the more you go to sort of the cutting edge, the, f- the further afield you have to look. Like think of things like fusion investments. You have to look ten years out for those. Um, and so it's it's just not it's just not that simple to you know pick a industry and invest in it without understanding the time horizon uh, and then you know the return on capital over that period of time. So for me, e-commerce. If I if, you know if you bring an e-commerce company to me I, and I make an investment, I'm looking six to twelve months ahead, like very short term. It's a very mature industry. The, the technical aspects of it are all solved. There aren't, there's no like technical issue in e-commerce that hasn't really been solved to a large degree. It's obviously on the on the periphery, on the margin. You get you know you can make small improvements. Uh, and I guess Nostra plays in that space, right? Like you, you're now saying, hey, this is a very mature market where uh, you know all the building blocks are in place. But now, how do we optimize that? How do we how do we squeeze more more juice out of the lemon? Uh, uh, or orange, or whatever you want to call it, um, and, and and so that's that for me. That's where I think th- those are the interesting companies where um, it's not really the infra- the infrastructure is in place. You know, you use Amazon, you use um, you know all the existing tools out there to build, you know, Shopify or whatever to build the, the sites. But now, now, what do you layer on top? And that and that's kind of more periphery investing. That's what I like. I like going to the, you know the the non obvious stuff. Yeah, absolutely. We would, you know, we're we're not a great solution for for stores that are like, hey, I don't even know what I'm going to sell yet. We're a solution if you're yeah. if you've got a business and you're saying, hey, I'm, you know, when I'm selling on Amazon, it's just selling through right away because it's such a great customer experience. How do I bring that level of sophistication from a technology perspective to a Shopify store and not have to hire a 50 person engineering team and be up and running in days? Um, exactly. that, that's more, you know, the world I'm in. Exactly. Um, wow. Kind of so have you been, been broadcasting for six hours and 50 minutes straight? Six hours and 50 minutes. Have you been on the whole time? No, I've been on and off, but, uh, I've been, I've been watching for at least for, for, for that amount of time. We've had some pretty amazing speakers. I mean, I'm, just, I'm, I'm watching that clock tick up. I'm like, wow, <laughs> that's some yeah. stamina, man. It's amazing. <laughs> Earlier we were at two thousand people on the stream. Um, I think right. now we're at two three hundred, so it's pretty cool. Great, that's awesome. Well, hi everyone. Um. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, anyways, we we've talked a little bit about earlier today, right before you came on, on not just customer acquisition because that's obviously very important, but acquiring the right customers. And this is something that we've talked about it at length. Kind of, how do you think about? acquiring the right customers how do you how do you build that from 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 scratch so what you what you need to do is understand your customers better so so from scratch is hard right so, so when you're building a customer based from scratch it's kind of like spray and pray you basically just you know, you're hoping to catch some some trend some data points that give you uh, a sense of like who your customers are if you're a local business you may find that you used to a whole bunch of um advertising, like this example, I live in San Diego. So if I was launching a local business, I'd run a whole bunch of ads in Google for San Diego. What I'd find is of the people who came to my site, only people who are in a certain locale, like five miles away from where I'm based. Like let's say it's a local business and I'm in Del Mar. Uh, it would be the high conversion rate for people who live lo- locally or close by, but very low conversion rate for uh, people who live in down San Diego, you know, downtown. And so then I would just target my ads to a, a more narrow location and say, well, I just want to target the people because they're more likely to come uh, into my small business because they're less than five miles away versus someone who's 20 miles away. So these are the things you have to look at. I think you've got to start off by just spending some money to get data and then you look at the data and then make better decisions and then improve the, the quality of traffic coming to the site. And what are the different ways you can segment that data? So let's say you, you have all this data and yes, you can do location or what are the other ways that, that, that business owners are, are looking at segmenting it so that they can really, you know, drive in on the right customer base. The, the most important segment of customers is focusing on the one, on the repeat customers. So you always want to focus on, if you look at your customer base, go in and see who are the people who don't just buy once off, they come back. Then look at and understand why is it that they come back? Is it because of something they've purchased? Is it because of where they live? Is it because 
um, you know, like certain skews of higher higher repurchase rates. Like, oh, this product's really good. They keep, and then you focus on where you got those customers from and how you you know you're, you should be tracking everything, and then go, well, how do we get more of those? Um, you you don't build a business on one source very easily. There's a few businesses out there that that do well with one source. So, good example from 15 years ago, uh, I had a search marketing company. Um, we had a client that made a lot of money on one source purchases. Guess what the purchases were? I have no idea. They would pay, They would spend a lot of money, a lot of money on search marketing, and they pay like a hundred dollars a click or whatever, some some crazy amount, right? They sold body bags, <laughs> and they just they made so much money um, because whenever there was a crisis in some part of the world, um, you know, some someone in that region would go online to Google and search body bags, and they they you know they were the number one world leader in you know emergency body bags, the right, you know, it's got to be a certain plastic type and whatever else. It's, it's kind of re- regular. But but whenever there was a natural disaster, you know, flood, earthquake, whatever, their sales, those are all ones of customers. You're not going to get those, um, you know, maybe, maybe in some cases, uh, the, you know, someone will come back from, from a certain region because of the, maybe like an earthquake region. But generally, all their customers were totally once off. So it was very difficult for them to look into their, I mean, how do you target these customers? Like, hey, if ever you need a thousand body bags, like you can't, right? It's it is what it is. But so they couldn't do that. So all they could do is focus on the point of purchase, which is search. And when people are searching for body bags, they would they would basically um, be able to target the ads there. Very different from the flower business, right? So uh, I'm an investor in in Bloomable in South Africa. It's the one of the, probably the second largest online florist in South Africa, and we have a very high repeat rate of uh, customers right because you buy flowers for your mom every year you buy flowers for your wife every single year and so those customers are the ones so you focus on like for us for example married married you know long-term relationship type couples are, are great because the guy's gonna keep buying flowers for his wife on a regular basis so we can pay two years worth of uh, of uh, you know potential profits for that customer because we expect him to be with us for five years or ten years or even longer so lifetime customer value is really a function of what you're selling and the nature of the product. And so, you know, you can't treat them, you can't treat the strategies the same. Uh, it just depends. Like, and, and some products have very, you know, some pro- very long replacement cycles. Like, okay, you're selling a washing machine. Maybe you, uh, you know, maybe someone replaces every five years, maybe seven years, a TV, maybe four or five years as well. So those are long cycles. So you can't really hope that in four years time that customer is going to come back. But in the flower business, you you expect every. I mean, there's always a, an occasion, right? There's Valentine's Day, there's Mother's Day, there's, there's 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 like enough occasions every year that even if the customer just purchases once or twice a year, that's a good regular customer. Yeah, I'm wondering if anybody's built a subscription service where you can just throw in, hey, M- Mother's Day, this is where my flowers go. Valentine's Day, this is where my flowers go, and birthdays, and you just plug them all in. I, like I think I, I actually think we do have that. I'm, I need to double check, but there's, um, uh, you know, there are, I know there are, there are places you can just put, you know, flowers on regular, on like regular order and stuff. Uh, I, I think I, I kind of think that you you don't really want that, um, because what you want to do is basically the you know, a large portion of the money in the flower business is through upsells. So when the mm-hmm. person goes to the checkout counter, it's like, hey, do you want to add? This chocolate, do you want to add this? And so that makes it the, the margin of the flowers are pretty tight, but it's all the upsells that make uh, make it worth it. So unless the person is on a subscription every single season or year and is willing to upgrade everything every single time, it's a little hard. And and you and you don't want to send the same thing every time either. So it's uh, flowers are a very differentiated uh, business offering. But that's just an example of the type of e-commerce um, stores you can operate. Yeah, absolutely. What it. You know, you've built one of the you you built in the past one of the best agencies, most prolific. Everybody knows it. Uh, marketing agencies. Can you talk to me a little bit about building that agency? Um, number sure. one, and then I'll have a couple follow ups from there. Sure. So I started the incubator in my uh, my my office, literally in Johannesburg in two thousand and three, uh, and I you know we myself and. We had three co-founders on board. We built the company over, you know, a couple of years. I think I, by the time I left in 20, 2008, so like after five years, it was doing 
I don't know, like a couple hundred million bucks in, in gross, in gross, but you know, uh, gross sales for our clients, uh, tens of million dollars in, in revenues. And that company's grown to about 300 million a year now in revenues. Um, we won all the top technology awards in South Africa, 2005, 2006. Uh, I, I joined Endeavor. Um, it was, it was a really interesting, uh, uh, you know, journey and story. And it was, it was tough because back in those days, funding was not really, really hard. Uh, and being based in South Africa was tough at the time. No one believed in tech and internet. And it was just a, a really tough business to be in. And then I left and packed up and went to Silicon Valley and, um, you know, uh, went on a different journey. But it was a grind. It wasn't easy. Um, but we, we had really good technology and insights into search. And a lot of, I mean, the, the, my, my VP of sales and other CEO, my, people are hired and trained junior people. The first 10 people, they're all senior people at the company now. So, I mean, I can't believe that most of us are working there. It's like 15, 20 years. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's unbelievable sometimes. Um, how have you seen, you know, e-commerce brands managing their agencies? Um, I often get complaints that, you know, X, Y, and Z, my agency isn't doing X, Y, and Z. And how, have, how, how would you advise an e-commerce store to, to manage an agency kind of like the one you built? I personally think that founders should manage their own their own um, advertising search, especially like like look the the tools to do search marketing are out there. It's really easy to do uh, if you if, you know you or your co-founder should do it. Um, it. The reason is especially in the early days, it gives you insights. What are people searching for? What are they clicking? You start digging into analytics. You start understanding the business better. I don't think this is something you want to outsource, especially in a small early stage startup. Later stage, it's different, right? But early stage. You know, you should always run it yourself uh, to get as much information and insight about the customer as possible. And and the platforms that allow advertising, they're just really easy to use. I mean, it was clunky back those days, 20 years ago, when I was doing it. Now it's super easy. Um, and so I, I always think that, you know, hiring a you, – you can hire a marketing person. They can help with other things. But I think that the the – the search stuff is actually really important for founders because founders need to understand what are people searching for? What do they want? What keywords are they typing in? What are they ultimately buying? What pages do they go to and then drop off? Um, yeah, and you can use AI for this, which is, I guess, what you're trying to do on some level. But, you know, AI is not going to, you know, there's no direct line. For, you can't plug AI into your own brain. You have to still absorb that data yourself. Not unless your, your friend Elon uh, figures that one out for us. You know, Neuralink's, Neuralink's getting there. <laughs> it's getting there. Um, when we're talking about customer retention, what tools, kind of what tricks, you know, we talked about SMS marketing earlier. Did, do you see companies using uh, to, to just retain their customers and upsell them and, you know, create a great long-term relationship with them? Kind of what tools are you seeing people use? Um, I have been out of it for a while, to be honest. I haven't, I'm not too close to the tool space. Um, so I wouldn't know what's out there right now. Um, I know that, I mean, uh, there's a lot you can just do with Google. Like Google's got a lot of tools built into Google Analytics. I I, I wouldn't advise using other stuff at this point. I, I just don't know. I couldn't advise Yeah. Um, and then as far as companies, building companies, you know, you've, you know, you've built a number of extremely successful businesses. What are the characteristics that, that, that kind of they have in common outside of just, you know, being started by Vinny kind of what, what do you bring? What is the culture that you bring that, that tends to have this enormous, you know, that tends to be successful? So I try to start companies in different sectors every time. I, I never try and do the same thing twice. So I'm not one of those people who goes from one ad agency to another. I just go do different stuff. I just find it more interesting and you learn, learn a lot more. I think what I bring is a different management approach. I, I, try to hire great people and just stay out of their way and uh, have them hire teams and build teams up. And I just try and create the guardrails for people to be innovative. So these are the constraints. This is the time box we have. These are the objectives in the short term. And I try and keep a very high level view on things. I dive into the details when I need to. I bring in resources when I need to, but I really try and empower my people to do, do stuff. So people don't see me as a boss. I, I hate the whole Vinny's the boss thing. It doesn't work for me. Um, yeah, I'm the CEO, but that's for different reasons. But I, I prefer to have people who I can coach, um, help grow. You know, so people need to find, like when you work in a company, 
um, the only time you want to be like have instruction is when you're still learning or you, you know, you're still learning your, your trade. When you are, you know, in the middle of your career and you know what you're doing, you just want the freedom to execute and to learn and make mistakes and not be punished for mistakes. I mean, I think when you look at like what's the what is the best way to sort of grow someone is, you know, the first mistake's free. Uh, the, the, you know, it's like three strikes, really. The, the, the first mistake, you get off free. Like, hey, no problem. The second mistake is like, you know, you raise an eyebrow. The third mistake, you're probably gone. And like, when I say the third mistake, if you do the same thing wrong three times, right? The first time you can let it off. You have to learn. Like, it's fool me once, shame on me, fool me twice. You know, um, how did George Bush put it? <laughs> you can't fool <laughs> me no more. <laughs> but anyway, um, I, I think that there's generally a three strike rule when it comes to learning. because like the thing is this you need to let people fail and you got to forgive them for failing but if they fail over over for the same thing they're not learning and then you have to ask yourself do you want that person in the organization absolutely yeah um creating that culture is you know if people don't feel comfortable to fail then how do you expect them to to to, to succeed and learn new things and you know yeah. you, the, when you're investing in someone you want you don't want to get the same person 10 years from now or five years from now. You want to get the person who you hired they, you know, as part of the early team at the ad agency, you can, you know, move up to be the VP of marketing, et cetera. Yeah. You can't, you can't, you can't scale unless you fail. <laughs> like it's really hard to, now there are exceptions, right? I mean, Elon probably doesn't want to have anyone fail with uh, SpaceX. I mean, he, they do, they make mistakes, but can you imagine like a crew going up and dying? Like that's not, that's not, uh, that's not very uh, good. So certain businesses, the cost, if the cost of failure is something like death, then you can't have failure, medical, airlines, whatever. But in a startup, okay, so someone screwed up and now they paid a thousand bucks for a customer, you know, because you overpaid on marketing. Okay, <laughs> the business shouldn't go under because of that. If a thousand bucks is what brings your business down, you've got bigger problems. Um, so you got to have people learn on the job and every company is unique, right? So every company, like the other thing is like, I, I've had this conversation with someone, um, he may be watching, um, he joined, he joined one of my companies and, uh, he was the most well-credentialed person you can imagine. I said, well, from your resume, you, you, you know, this is exactly what I said to him. I said, from your resume, it's very apparent that you know how to learn. And he was he, you know, kind of smiling cause he was like, always, oh, I said, but do you know how to unlearn? And he was like, what? I said, because the stuff you've learned in, in college and university, it may not be applicable yet. I mean, the difference between theory and practice is in theory, there's no difference. And in practice, there is. And so, you know, he got along really well with me and we, you know, we did well and you know, he, he's great and still keep in touch. But, and he always says to me, that was one of the very most important lessons he learned going from this very academic mindset to the practical mindset is that sometimes you have to unlearn what you've learned. You like your experiences in one area, in one company, in one, don't apply and the, 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 the physics are just different when you go from one entity to another. And when you're looking at that, how do you how do you determine, all right, this person has this amazing resume, but I'm confident that they'll be able to unlearn those bad things. How do you, how do you see that in someone? Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's. It's hard. I, I don't ha I don't actually have a good answer for that. I think that you, you have to have a read on people. Um, I think the best way to do it is take a take a, a you know take a a group of resumes. Like I mean, interviewing ten people for a position should be the goal uh, if you can. Because when you interview ten people, it's like put it this way: Do you know how many times mis mistakes have been made? When essentially what happens is you go and find you, you post a job spec. The first guy, the first guy who walks in there, uh, you basically say, "Oh, this guy knows what he's doing. Great, he's hired." Right. So now you've made like. A, a selection bias. You only had one opportunity to evaluate one person. You didn't have any comparison, no baseline, no comparison. And because you're so desperate to fill that position, you hire this person. In almost every example I've ever ha seen, when there was only one candidate for the job, there may be some exceptions, but it's ninety percent of the ch time, I I'll tell you now, that was the wrong hire. Because if you line up ten people, there's a good chance you will find someone better. Or at least that, because like, think about it. If you just take a random sample of 10 people and you pick one randomly and, and if, you know, like 90% chance, you're not going to get the best candidate yeah. just on, a random, on a random selection, right? Um, and so if you just have one person to pick from and there were potentially nine others that you didn't interview, you still have that same 90% chance of picking the wrong person. 
But if you interview all 10 people and you can make a well-qualified assessment, your, your chances of picking the right person go up considerably. Yeah, and it seems to be the same with anything. You know, if you want, if you want it done well, you run a process. It's the same yeah. for financing a business, I'm sure. Um, yeah. If you want the right investors, don't wait for the first one to say that they're willing to invest in you. Go well, find me. That's, I wouldn't say that. So, so here's the other thing. Like, here's another example of theory and practice, right? In theory, that's true. In practice, when you're back up against a wall, you've got a tight timeline. Someone gives you a good term sheet. They seem like they're good. They're going to close quickly. You take it, Right. It's, you know, you balance the odds and the risks of going out there, running out of money and not closing the round. So it's not always as simple as that. But in the case of hiring, hiring great people and building great companies, and I think your question to me was, how do you do it? I like to, I like to basically get the right people on board and empower them to do that, to do what they need to do to, to succeed. And the only way you do that is by making sure that the upfront selection bias isn't, isn't in play. So I use stuff like, uh, typically, I used to use it a lot when I was more operational, but uh, Thomas International, it's kind of like you know, Myers-Briggs testing, all that stuff. Tr try to get a, a full view of the person, their personality, what do they do, how do they think about the world, and interview five or ten people and then say, okay, this is the, you know, stack rank them and this is probably the best candidate for the job. And if you're not happy with those 10, go keep, keep looking for someone else. You don't have to hire one of them. The best situation is when you have two amazing candidates and you can't decide which one's better. Like that's a great problem to have. Um, but when you, you know, when you have 10 bad candidates and you have to pick the, the least worst one, that's, that's a bad problem. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And that, that's not a position anybody wants to be in. Um, when you're looking at, you know, uh, taking a, 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 a turn here to, to the investment side. Um, number, the first thing is, you know, you're looking at these markets. You, you seem to be an expert in, in, in crypto and Web3. How did in 2014 you kind of get the understanding, oh, this is going to be interesting. This is really going to gonna, gonna move the needle. This is something I want to spend the next decade plus of my life thinking about. What were the signals that, that came to you that enabled you to, 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 to be early to that market? Well, I, I think a large part of it is the fundamental understanding of the internet because I was, you know, I mean, I was part of the earliest movements with, you know, USC students connecting networks between, uh, you know, like very, very slow lines back then, T1 connections and stuff in South Africa and understanding how, like, and I guess base, being based in South Africa was interesting because you understood how um, the U.S. internet versus the European internet, versus South, uh, South African, like how slow things are, how many hops it takes to move like data from one place to another, and how just like clunky it is, and you know just the evolution of like that model to edge servers and CDNs, and you know I, I've been through the whole the whole so, you know the whole journey. Um, my conclusion was that the web is probably best as a global mesh network um, of servers connected to each other. But with content, for example, Filecoin, uh, you can have content redundancy anywhere, locally, internationally, whatever. And uh, and you can just run proofs to make sure that the content's available in, in certain regions and like have no censorship. Like that's a better form of what the internet is today. Um, it's faster, it's quicker, it's cheaper for transferring data. Um, so... I was one. I was the first investor in in, in Filecoin in Protocol Labs in 2014 because I, I saw that vision, and now it's you know it's probably the biggest data storage network on the planet. Um, Filecoin, I think, is probably the most underrated crypto uh, project out there right now, given everything I'm seeing and how they're just growing and going from strength to strength. Um, you know, so when I, Bitcoin was the same, and I was uh, saw my last company the first data, and uh, I was able to see the payment stack and how I mean how broken it is, right? It's like, you know, you get a card issued to you, which connects to a bank. The bank connects to uh, Visa. Visa has merchant acquirers. When you go swipe your card, it goes like, you know, merchant acquirer uh, through Visa, through, you know, um, well, through First Data as a gateway, then merchant, then Visa, then it goes to your bank, and then the bank settles. And it's, I mean, the whole credit card payment was a whole bunch of IOUs floating around back and forth. <laughs> it's like that's why you have chargebacks and all that stuff that happens um it's very convoluted and something like bitcoin is just very much a peer-to-peer -peer payment mechanism um so it's it's it just appealed to me um yeah that's that's great and talk to me about solana you you know that's been an absolutely amazing investment 
how did you come across the founders? You know, what, what initially attracted you to the business and, you know, you know, what did you do kind of as an investor to, to help it grow? Well, um, I met Anatoly and Raj in the early days. Uh, they were starting out doing 18. And I met them through a guy named David Quick, who is a founder that I backed in a previous company. And he introduced me to Anatoly because they play underwater hockey together. And he's like, I don't understand this blockchain thing. Can you like, this is my friend from hockey. Can you like chat to him? I was like, okay, sure. Yeah. Another Russian guy named, uh, well, he's a Ukrainian guy, but like, you know, Ukrainian guy named Anatoly, like crypto is full of these guys. I mean, let me have a chat with him. And he walks in the office and, you know, after five minutes, I was like, okay, this guy's actually smart. I mean, he's, you know, he's not like the average guy uh, uh, you meet on the streets. He's just brilliant. Um, and we had an amazing conversation. Um, at the time, I was a GP at Multicoin Capital, and I brought the deal into the firm. And so we invested in 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 um, Solana. I, you know, I'm an advisor to Solana. I was an advisor to Solana, uh, and helped you know met up with Anatoly and Raj on a regular basis for sushi and whatever else to go to the office for meetups, uh, and just try to help early stage build awareness for Solana. And yeah, here we are today. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And kind of what. So that, that's what's gone right in the investing career. I'm sure there are plenty if, if you're betting this early on, on companies that Always. have not gone right. Well, are yeah. there any common characteristics on, on businesses that you back that just have not panned out? It's always the founder. When things go wrong, it's always the founder. It's like something was wrong. Yeah. The founder is, it, it, it's difficult to, to, to spot a good founder. Uh, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say always. Like sometimes the investors screw things up as well and make it difficult. But generally, like, the you know, the most successful companies are the founders just, they just don't quit. I mean, the founders that quit are the ones where I guess, you know, you can kind of, I mean, I don't blame people. I mean, things get tough, right? But um, it's the gritty, persevering founders that, that you know, that make it. Yeah. So you're looking at the the video space. You're looking at the crypto space. What what other worlds? What other ecosystems trends are you monitoring today that you think you might be early on tomorrow? Um, right now, I would say. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm still deep in the crypto rabbit hole. I think that you know, NFTs are interesting. Um, I don't think there's anything else outside of that that really is taking off. There's, there's some, you know, some energy stuff, I guess. Um, you know, climate change stuff, but um, it's not in my it's not in my sort of purview, and I don't have a good insight into it. So for me, it's like I want to see I want to see crypto play out a bit longer from the investor side, from the operational side. I'd, I'd like to get see how Waitrim does and how we're able to you know create different types of meeting formats. Absolutely. And so what, you know, you, you go from being on the cutting edge with the internet to the, to, to FinTech, to crypto and kind of, to kind of moving back uh, to, to video, something that, you know, in your words, it's, it's, it's not quite crypto as far as being, you know, new, what, what's drawing you to this space and, you know, what do you think the the world's going to look like in the in the video world in the next couple of years? Um, look, I think at the time we 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 started the company was in the middle of COVID, so I, I think the thesis was that remote work was never going to we never going to go back in the office or at least for a long time. Not entirely true. People are moving back to the office, but I think that there's a, a big there's a bigger acceptance of like global companies global talent pools, remote working. And so um, that's the trend we're going to follow. We're going to try and just see how, because like the, the tools that were built prior to COVID were not really built for, you know, remote teams and remote collaboration as much as just being on video and having a quick call. And so I think that we, we, we're, I mean, we're an early stage product company. We're just basically iterating on these ideas and seeing whether we can test and find product market fit. So it's not a, it's not a slam dunk. Here's a eureka moment. We figured it out. There's a lot of, you know, hard work that needs to go into it. Absolutely. And so when it comes to financing a business, you know, you've raised venture capital dollars, you've been an angel investor. Uh, you've also, I assume your, your agency was mainly bootstrapped um, yeah. the entire time. Yeah. When you're, when you're founding a company and you're looking at a market, 
kind of what is your thought process around financing, you know, from, hey, from the idea stage to, okay, we have some traction, kind of where, where does your mind go when you're thinking about, all right, we're starting a new company, should I bootstrap it? Should I start the company kind of w- up front with some capital? What, what's the best way to go about that? It depends on what you're building. It's, uh, there's no easy answer there. It depends on what you're building. If you're doing an e-commerce site, bootstrap it. Um, if you're doing a nuclear reactor, go raise capital. It's like, it depends on what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, um, that, that's definitely, definitely true. And one of the things we talked about when it comes to finding investors is the quality of investor and kind of how that makes a very big difference in the long term. And it's actually quite frankly, better to take worse terms and have high quality investors. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about why that is the case? Um, I think taking worse terms from better investors is basically like the, the better investors are going to give you more value add typically. And that's why they consider better investors, whether it's through networking or helping you raise your next round or giving you some advice and, looking at your metrics and, and some deep analysis. So I think um, entrepreneurs become too price sensitive and too worried about dilution. Focus on like optimize for success, not dilution. It's kind of my, my, my motto. Like if you care about how much equity you have in the end of the day and your, your company fails, it's not going to make a difference. Yeah, there's a saying a, a VC gave me was good comp or it's uh Success is measured in multiples and ownership is measured in percent. You know, you, you, you want a bit successful business, especially for, for first time founders out there. It's, it's just, you know, you have a successful company. You can go on to start three, four, five other companies kind of similar to Vinny. But if you don't have a successful company, you know, it doesn't matter how much you own. Yeah, exactly. And so on a day-to-day basis, running a company, having all these different investments, kind of how do you keep yourself focused on kind of moving the needle forward on all these different fronts? It's hard. I mean, I, you know, I would have juggled a whole bunch of balls uh, in the air. So I try to just not do um, too much outside of what my core efforts are. Um, like, you know, if you were in one of my portfolio companies, I wouldn't be on this call because I could just it takes up time right uh, so you, you got to just prioritize um, to help and the people that you just you need to help because that's what your responsibility is and then focus on those areas just, you got tri- you constantly triaging like what's more important and uh, and prioritizing your time yep and then you know we just have a couple questions or a couple uh, minutes left here you know, what have been the kind of m- more wild rides in the business world you know selling your business, um, you know, what have been kind of the, the crazy events that have happened that, that kind of, they're like, wow, this is, this is what it's like to be an entrepreneur, the ups, the downs. And are there a couple key moments that you can think of? Um, dude, it's, 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 there's always ups and downs. I mean, every, every business I've been involved in has come to the brink of like failure multiple times. Uh, and that includes like things like Solana, like when they, they became close in the, in, in, in the, in the down cycle. I mean, it was, it was tough for them. There was no money you'd be raised. It was really, really tough. Most businesses within, you know, if you, you look, if you don't come close to failure, you weren't trying hard enough. It's kind of the motto of the general wisdom in Silicon Valley. You got to just push it to the, to the end. Absolutely. Um, and you know, we only have a couple minutes left. So any last kind of bits of advice, things that they, that you just think are, are very important for, for entrepreneurs out there, and for people in the e-commerce sector, you know, where most of the audience is? So for first-time founders, I always recommend having a co-founder. And so don't try and start businesses by yourself. Split the equity with someone and, and have, have a wing, wing person next to you to try and build this up. And then don't give up. So you take those two things, put them together, your chances of success are going to be up like 80% more than not having those two things. So you know, optimize for improving the, the, you know, the underlying variables to make a business successful. Perfect. And if people want to reach out, learn more about weight room, learn more about your investments, kind of what's the best way to, to, uh, to, to, to reach out. I'm pretty active on Twitter. So at Vinny Lingham, you'll find me there. Easy enough. Awesome. All right. Well, Vinny, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate it. I know how busy you are. So appreciate you being on the stream today. No worries. And thanks everyone for tuning in. Thanks for having me, Arthur. Thank you.
All right. So next we have one of the most knowledgeable people in all of e-commerce when it comes to, you know, understanding how to build an e-commerce store, how to run uh, the store when it comes to your app stack, when it comes to, uh, you know, really having a, a, a robust app 